Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and this week we're going to be talking to Bob from Retro RGB. Let's get to it. Now, if you're not familiar with RetroRGB.com, it is both a website and a YouTube channel. They cover, of course, all the latest news in the retro gaming scene, which is always an exciting place to uh, follow. And then they've got a bunch of getting started guides for connecting up your old consoles to your modern TVs. And they go into more advanced topics like RGB, where you can get the most out of that stuff. It's a great place because you can start at the beginning and really get something better than the basics going without a lot of cost or time. And then if you really want to dig into the nuances of some of the more advanced topics, he's got that covered too. He's got great latency tests, all sorts of good stuff. And we're going to talk to Bob here in just a second. I've got chapter markers on the video here so you can quickly jump to topics that interest you. And then Bob interviewed me in a separate interview that's on his YouTube channel right now. And I'll put a link to that down below as well if you can handle listening to us for three hours straight. I had a great time uh, talking to him the other day. So without further ado, let's get to that interview with Bob. And joining me now is Bob from Retro RGB. Hello, Bob. How are you today on this snowy or aftermath here in the <laughs> Northeast U.S.? I'm good. How's it going, Lon? It's going well. So I thought I'd have you on. Um, the last time we saw each other was at uh, one of those retro festivals in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, retro, retro, retro World, World. Expo. Yeah. Yep. And we did a fun panel, which I hope you all watch on FPGAs. Um, that's been getting some views over time because people are curious about FPGA and the Mr. Project and everything. So it's been fun to do that. And you know, we had a, a really fun conversation throughout that weekend about your origin story. And I thought it'd be fun to bring you on and talk about your site, which is retrorgb.com. Uh, mm -hmm. And also just talk about you know, how you got started doing this, because this is a full-time gig for you now, right? Yeah, it's been for just over two years now. I think going on the third year, I believe almost. So, yeah, it's been kind of a, a weird roller coaster ride, and I'm sure I'm gonna have a million questions for you during all this as well, because uh, um, I got to know you on a Smoke Monster stream that one time, just randomly. We were both on, and then I guess we've we've sort of kept in touch since. So this is gonna be a lot of fun. I definitely have some questions for you though, <laughs> for some of the products you review and all that other stuff as well. Great. And this is going to be a freewheeling conversation. Bob and I were talking about this. Like, you know, it, it's structured, but it's not structured. We're just going to talk and, and just kind of talk like we would normally talk if we were on the phone or in person. So, um, so let's begin. First of all, what is Retro RGB about? Just so people understand this who, who haven't seen you before. Sure. So the current, the current um, Retro RGB is kind of two things. It's a news site so if you go to the main page it's uh, keeping people in the loop of all of the cool projects going on in the retro gaming scene mostly homebrew but you know anything that i think a retro gamer would be uh, would be relevant to retro gamers myself or any of the other writers will just you know put up their thoughts on it but it started out as a way to get the the best quality you can out of your retro consoles and it still is that uh, there's still a ton of guides for how to do basic rgb mods and stuff like that um but it just it, it kind of started out because i remembered there was this thing called rgb on consoles from the 80s and 90s and it just was unfathomably expensive back then so you know when i started to get back into retro and, and buy some original consoles and hook it up with composite i thought you know this is great but isn't there more to it and there was no info out there all in one place that was scattered across forums and it was the typical you know five different people claiming theirs is the best with no info to back it up so uh, i basically took all of the hard work of the community um vetted it myself and then kind of came up with the best way to do a lot of these mods and through through doing that i got to meet some incredibly talented people that are much better at these mods than i am so it's kind of evolved into showcasing other people's work um both because you know why show something i could do when somebody else does it better and also it's impossible for even one small group of people to keep up with all of this stuff so um well i still like to hope that it's the hub for people that we uh, want to get started with retro gaming on any level plug in with composite or all the way up to the best signals you can get um you know i still hope it's the hub for that but it is focusing more on showcasing other people and kind of keeping all of this stuff alive through new contributions and stuff like that in many ways, you're a journalist covering this this niche of a of the consumer electronics market, right? I mean, that's you know you know enough about yeah. the topic to to know what's good and what isn't, and and to bring in and and help get the word out for things that are good that people should be looking at, right? 
Yeah, that is kind of what it evolved into. And uh, it's funny because I used to just refer to myself as like the retro gaming middleman. And one of my friends <laughs> was like, no, 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 you're the curator. You're going to call yourself right. the curator. <laughs> so. The journalist, the curator, everything. Exactly. And it's fun that yeah. we were able to bring you in looking exactly like you do on your YouTube channel with the same camera and everything. It works. It looks great here. So that's awesome. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I got this setup streamlined pretty well for noise and for everything else, and uh, also, you know, my you know my uniform, typical black <laughs> yeah, that's shirt. Right. Which, you know, I started uh, trying to do that because there were when I first started doing the podcast, there it would be very often that I would you know it would take forever, and I would have to start again the next day, and then I'd realize oh I got a different shirt on or something like that, uh, and then I just was like you know what. As a fat guy, I look thinner and black anyway. So black t-shirt <laughs> is my uniform. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> now, so what, what's been interesting about the, the entire retro gaming thing, especially playing game consoles, you know, for me, it started obviously back when I was a kid. That Sega Genesis mm -hmm. behind me is the one that, that I had in 1989. It was one of the early release units that was at to Toys R Us in Connecticut in August of 89. And, you know, I, I played video games like every other kid did. I was not very good at them, but I just really loved video games and the hardware around it. And then, of course, mm -hmm. over time, you sell your systems for eBay dollars and be able to, you know, so you can buy new things. And then, you know, I've been emulating for probably the last 20 or 30 years. In fact, I got interviewed for a Hartford Current article back in 1998 when MAME first came out. Um, and I'll have to link to that at some point. Uh, but, you know, what, what was interesting was at some point I realized that the emulation, even though you, you think it's just as good, it, it really isn't, is it? No. Um, it, it all... It all depends on what your experience or what the goal of your experience is. You know, if you say, hey, uh, I, I want to remember what it's like to play Super Mario Brothers or somebody told me about this game that was made before I was born. I just want to see what it's like. Picking up an emulator, installing it on your phone and playing for a minute or two is totally good. You're going to get all of that blast of nostalgia or the basic experience of it. But it's when you start actually sitting down and playing. And there's anything from little annoyances like audio quirks that kind of hurt your ears, especially uh, you know on those terrible <laughs> emulation consoles that you'll right. sometimes see, all the way to games crashing uh, and lots of lag, which is definitely the bane of all retro gamers existence here because all of these games were designed for a very fixed amount of time from when you press a button to when there's movement on the screen so you know there's a, a video out there by a guy phone dork who kind of freaks out in the middle of his video because he can't play on a laggy um upscaler because every time he tries to time his jumps in Mega Man, he can't do it because the lag is never the same over and over. And that was the whole point of a lot of these games is you, you program your muscle memory. You're not actually reacting in real time. You're reacting to your muscle memory of, of doing it over and over. But if you use bad emulation or bad scalers, it's impossible because it's never the same thing twice. So that's why it's kind of funny because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's proven that human reaction time is, is you know, only, you know, 16 milliseconds. It's impossible to go behind that or, or faster than that. And that's just it's it's true, but it's not true. It, it's certainly true with reaction time. Like I'm going to turn on this light bulb and see how quickly you could react. But when you're programming your moves and you're going on muscle memory, you can get to things that I believe the fastest people have been reacting to is there's been proven tests of eight milliseconds and faster than hmm. a lot of these moves. And with some of the new speed running stuff coming out now, I believe it's even faster. So wow. it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. And as you mentioned, you said that, that the lag sometimes changes. So it's not mm -hmm. that it's always a 20 millisecond lag. It could be 20, 30, 40, right? Is that, I think you did some right. testing with that, right? Yeah, I've done I've done so much testing on that. I've become like the lag guy now because no, <laughs> right. nobody else really to goes to <laughs> yeah, yeah, nobody else really goes to the extent. Anybody could run these tests though. Mm -hmm. But I always make it a point to show how I do it, both to prove that I'm not lying and in hopes that other people will start doing this. But yeah, that's something that you could actually measure with tools and through gaming. I had a friend of mine, Beast, come over to help me test a Neo Geo emulation console. And we measured it at about two frames of lag but it was almost always two frames of lag. So it took him, you know, he's on the pro level of playing. And, it and by the way, when we talk him, about frames of lag here, we're talking about, I guess, 60 frames per second, it takes, uh, is how often the screen gets updated, right? So two frames correct. would be within that context, you'll have right. two cycles of the display before 
the reaction appears. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. So uh, on NTSC televisions, a frame is 16.5 milliseconds, and that's how long it takes from top to bottom to draw the full image before moving on to the next. Um, And, you know, he was able to just, it took him a couple of minutes, but he was able to just adjust his timing. Um, And a lot of uh, TVs are like that as well. So if your TV has one or two frames of lag, it just takes you a while to get used to it. You could adjust your timing. You don't even really know, unless you knew what you what was going on, you wouldn't even realize it. You would just think it took you a while to get back into the swing of it. But anytime it's variable of even one frame, if you're playing a harder game or if you're a pro player, um, but a lot of these, a lot of the emulation solutions like the Genesis Mini and a lot of the very bad scalers that I hope no one's using anymore <laughs> could range up to five frames of variable lag. Wow. So it's two to seven frames on some of these. And it just, you know, turn by turn RPGs, you'll never notice a difference. But, huh. you know, Mega Man fighting games, right. um, heck, even Super Mario Brothers running and timing your jumps. You know, it's just it's Makes impossible to get through them and have the same experience. And when we talk about those poor scalers, these are those 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 HDMI scalers that you find on on Amazon or some other place where it just you plug in your composite and it gives you an HDMI output, right? Yeah, so there, there's two, that can be broken up into two categories. So there's the scalers that were always designed for TV signals, VCRs, DVD players, that somebody said, hey, I think we could try to use these for video games, um, but they were never designed for video games. So while, you know, while I always throw shade at them, it's not their fault. That's not what they were designed to do. You right, know? they were designed like for they, your VCR or something, right? Not to play games and be, be exactly accurate, right? Yeah, it's like getting in a four-cylinder car and trying to drive it, you know, pull a giant trailer behind you. You don't get mad at the car for that, you know? Uh, But unfortunately, there were some companies that have popped up that took those chips designed for TV signals and put them into things designed uh, or labeled as designed for gaming, but they perform really badly. And some of the stories behind how those started are actually incredibly shady. So I don't even want to tell them. I don't want to bring down the podcast. (laughs) Right, 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 right. There's there's more than enough proof to to show it. It was very intentional that they just wanted a quick cash grab. And then once those chips are out there, it's a free for all. So the people who came next weren't so weren't so evil about it. But yeah, it's it's pretty awful to the point where if this wasn't an entertainment device, if it was a GPS or a thermometer, it would absolutely be pulled off the market. Like right. that that's how terribly they perform at what they're doing. Wow. But entertainment okay. devices, other than basic, you know, yeah, uh, regulation, really. regulations, mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. nothing on it. So and, and, you know, I've been watching on my Facebook feed lately, and certainly during the pandemic or people are locked down, you know, they're grabbing their old Nintendo out of the closet that hasn't been booted up in years. Um, they're hooking it up to their, to their HD television and they're realizing it looks terrible, like even worse than it did on a, on a, on a CRT yeah. screen. I remember I got up back when I, when I bought my first house and 20 years ago now, um, I bought one of the first uh, HD TVs, which was a 1080i CRT HD television. It was a Panasonic. It weighed 300 pounds. It was this enormous <laughs> yep. thing. And I remember. I, I, remember I, you know, I was all excited. I get home. I plug in my my uh, my PlayStation or whatever it was I was using at that point in time, and it didn't look that great. I had to really work no. at the the settings to get the game to look as good as it did on the CRT that replaced it. So mm-hmm. if if I'm somebody that you know, has that old console and I want to use it again and I want to use it with my HD TV and all these scalers out there are of mixed quality. What do you recommend right now as the best solution for me to, to take that console out and put it on my HD television? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I probably started out my last explanation wrong in that there are a bunch of bad scalers, but there's also a bunch of very good scalers by people who are designing it specifically for retro gaming and, and take all these things into account. And at the moment, the best entry level one is definitely any of the retro tank products made by a guy named Mike Chi. Mm-hmm. And um, the cheapest one, I think, is the mini. And you just stick in your composite and your S video right into it. And you don't have to worry. Um, if you want to go with the higher quality signals, you can get the different retro tank products or uh, something called the open source scan converter, which is a little more complicated and only takes the higher end signals. But they're all excellent. They're zero lag. And uh, one of the things that I had learned that I actually, I didn't, I had known, but I hadn't known to this extent is when the RetroTINK Mini came out, I'd always known that the basic inputs, analog inputs of a TV um, were very low quality and probably not meant for gaming at all. Um, But I really wanted to put that to the test because I wanted to answer the question that I knew everybody would have is that why would I buy this thing for 60 bucks if my TV already has a composite input? And, uh, 
all of the TVs that I tested, there's probably 10 of them. Not only did the composite video and if, if they even had S video inputs, um, not only did they add a ton of lag, but they processed video game signals wrong to the point where sometimes they wouldn't work at all. Or if they did work, it would be a total weird flickery mess. Hmm. So then I went back and started lag testing analog inputs versus HDMI inputs. And on every TV I tested, going through the analog inputs added like an extra frame of lag to it all. Wow. So it just, those inputs on the back of your TV Are were terrible. only designed <laughs> for like, hey, I have an old VCR, I have an old DVD player, and right. I don't want to upgrade to a Blu-ray yet, you know, just make it work for now. But they really should not be used at all for gaming. And that obviously, that that's not... That probably doesn't talk about every single TV that's ever been released. I'm sure there's a few out there that do a decent job with composite video, but the ones I like to try to test is like your your average TVs of today, your TCLs, the cheap LGs, mm -hmm. Vizios, stuff like that. So it's a uh, yeah, it's you can't even though you can physically plug them in, you really shouldn't just plug them in and start going. You would need to go through some sort of some scaler device, right? That and, yeah. and, and there's so many there's so many variables, right? So you have the scaler variable. Uh, the retro tank mm -hmm. obviously makes that a little bit easier because it 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 is not introducing any additional lag based on how it works. Um, right. Not to get technical, but it's it's a line doubler and not make it's not upscaling the image. Your TV is doing that. Uh, then you mm -hmm. have, of course, the television you're plugging it into. Um, if you're using a retro console, obviously the controller's not adding lag to the mix, but some wireless solutions might. So there's all these different things right, that come right. into play. Which TVs would you say, if you were looking, and granted, TVs change every five minutes as far as the, the, the model numbers and, the, and whatever version of it's out, uh, but which TVs have you seen that, that tend to work the best in that scenario? All the ones I've tested that have been released in the past few years are totally fine. Um, I haven't based seen on one the HDMI so far, input. based on the HDMI input. Yeah, mm -hmm. I haven't seen one that that stood out as holy crap, this is terrible. Um, mm -hmm. There's the LG ones that I've tested have gotten pretty fast. They only have five ish milliseconds of lag, which is undetectable, uh, you know, in every way, as long as you use the right scaler. Um, and it, it just it makes it so much easier because for for a while there, you know, how do I how do I get started in retro gaming? Well, the answer was always grab a free CRT off the side of the road right. and use whatever <laughs> cables it came with. And exactly. there you go. It's, a per, you know, RF is a perfectly good experience on a CRT. But, you know, many people don't want to deal with that and those aren't going to be around forever. So what's the next step? Well, grab whatever original cables that came with your console use at the moment retro tank is pretty much the only brand that would really nail it with composite i'm sure there's going to be more at some point um and then go through that into your flat flat panel tv and that's it it's all you need it's not going to be the sharpest you're going to notice things that you didn't notice on a crt but that in my opinion at least it doesn't take away from the experience and in some ways it's like it kind of reminiscent of the crappy look of older TVs, just in a different way. But it's, right. it's certainly not a bad experience uh, as long as you just plug it in through at the moment a retro tank and uh, and don't use Bluetooth wireless controllers. Right, uh, those also add like two frames of lag, if not more. <laughs> so you can really you can really be compounding your lag as you go down the chain here with if you do Bluetooth a lousy composite connection in the TV, and before you know it, you're you're a second oh, yeah. behind maybe. And and you know it's funny yeah, back in the TV day in game mode. I always forget to say that. I oh, that's just right. Yeah, everybody knows always put your TV in game mode. The difference is because I mean, there's no reason to have a low latency panel if you're watching TV or movies. So uh, very often TV manufacturers put in all these features that add a ton of lag, which mean, means nothing for a TV show. So just always put your TV in game mode. <laughs> so good scaler, um, namely the retro tank. I have one I use. I, I bought the original one, which I, I've been nice. amazed by because it works with everything that I have here. I even capture with it. Um, so the retro tank is great. Uh, a, a recent TV, most should be okay, as you say, the, the most recent ones. Um, make mm -hmm. sure you're in game mode, and, and then when you plug that console in, it should, it should look pretty good. Now, that's, we're talking composite S-video, the stuff that's built in, um, but if we wanted to ratchet up our game a little bit, we start getting into the, the RGB world, right? So yeah. um, this is where it gets, it gets trickier. Um, I know my RetroTINK has RGB inputs, and Component I went out... Component video inputs. Uh, what's that? Component, component video. video I'm sorry. Inputs. That's right. Yeah. Component video inputs the, the the red, the green, and the blue. Right. Um, I bought um, a fancy cable for my Sega Genesis to plug into mm -hmm. that. Right. So, what what would you suggest? Because every system is different. Some support RGB out of the box. Others require modifications. I got an old NES 
do I have any hope of, of improving that image quality or are we pretty much stuck yeah. with composite? So step one and two is easy. And then once you get past that, here's where it gets complicated. It's, you know, step one, do I actually want to play these games or is it a shot of nostalgia or is it, you know, somebody recommended it to me? Try it anyway. Any emulation, any of those classic boxes, just try it and see. And if you find yourself actually enjoying the games, grab an original console and then just plug it into either a CRT or at the moment RetroTank is the only uh, good scaler that accepts composite video directly. And then just, just use whatever cables you have with it. Don't spend too much money and go from there. And for many people, that's all they need. It's good enough, uh, especially if your TV happens to scale the image well. But if you want to take the next step, that's when you have to do some research and that's when it could fork off into many equal choices, which is what makes it more complicated. There isn't a, well, there's only one good path. Right. Know, there's many choices for different people's setups. And, and one lucky of the for you, there is multiple paths because that's what keeps your site going, right? I mean, you have yeah, to there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you need a place to go. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the, I think one of the biggest things, especially for everybody in North America, is RGB and component video are equal, but not compatible. So one isn't better than the other, uh, but all of these most of these older consoles either output RGB or can be modified to. So for a lot of them, Super Nintendo and Genesis, you could just plug in an RGB cable or cables that convert RGB to component. Um, or you could do most, most of the time, it's actually a pretty complicated mod to get RGB out of it. You'd want to contact a professional or, or really do some research, but all of these would be able to output RGB or component video, depending on it. And then and by scaling... the way, I think we should back up to what, what, why is RGB better than component? Just in case people are so wondering. In the case of most of these consoles, um, imagine, I imagine your listeners would know the basics of a computer and a video card. So imagine a video card inside of a computer and there's ones and zeros that are all making up, you know, the, the image. And if you want to use your, let's just say, you know, your VGA output of it, the first thing that that is converted to when it goes from digital to analog is four signals on these game consoles, red, green, and blue with all of the brightness and color information isolated in each channel. And then um, either one or two, depending on the computer or console channels that are the synchronization. They, and for uh, gaming, it's RGBS, we just call it sync. And that tells uh, the screen where to put everything that you're sending it to. So having all of those together is the first way the signal is generated before it's been uh, compressed down to other formats. And that's why it is the best is because it's on these older consoles. Um, in the analog realm, uh, you know, the highest quality. There are definitely mods out there that take the digital signals on some of these consoles and go direct to HDMI, which is yet another really awesome option, all depending on what your goal is. And a lot of people that only want to play on flat, uh, flat panels will take something like an original Nintendo, uh, N64, original PlayStation, Dreamcast, and Xbox all have internal HDMI mods. And the GameCube actually has a plug and play one. You don't even need to mod it. You just plug it in and you can get direct digital HDMI. And then, so, then, then get out your soldering iron when you got to go and modify though, right? That's, that's where it gets, yeah. that, that goes beyond perhaps what I could do. Um, but th there's people that could do that for you, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. So, you know, going, going that next step, you have to decide, do you want to use, uh, you know, CRTs or do you want to use flat panels? And then what type of CRTs? Really good consumer grade ones that you could just pick up and play? Or do you want to find professional video monitors, which are things that were anywhere from five to $50,000 all the way up into the, you know, mid 2000s, um, which is basically just the best CRTs ever made. So you get, even with composite video, it looks better. Um, and what path you choose, that's which cables you would want to go about, what mods you want to go about using, if you need a scaler or not. So that, that's where it gets super confusing. And that's where hopefully someday I get to do some kind of interactive, like um, part picker type of thing on the website. So you could pick your end goal and then back your way through it to see what mods you would need or something like that. Who would have thought video games from the 80s would get so complicated? You know, I think about like my Atari yeah. 2600. How would I even hook that up to my, <laughs> to my right. HDTV at this point? And there's so much nostalgia baked into that because of the controllers and, and the switches and, and all of that. It's just, it's just, it, it's almost like this stuff is getting lost, right? So it's, it's great to have some guides out there like your site to, to kind of get people into that realm. Um, and let's, let's pivot over to CRTs for a second. So I was very fortunate because my father was renovating his house 
and he was getting rid of all of his old TVs. They were all in the basement. He had a JVC uh, with RGB input on the back. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't realize it had it until like, I looked at it a few, a few months ago, about, actually about last year. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got an RGB input on my TV. He had component input on it. Um, yeah. I was really, really surprised and lucky. Most TVs won't have that. They might have an S video or whatever. So I, I guess if you have a CRT, composite, first of all, will look better than you might think, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you have S video, that's probably the next best thing um, to use if you have that, right? On your yeah, console so, and your TV. Um, depending on where you live, uh, so if you're out in the middle of nowhere, RF and composite could look very, very similar, especially if you have a nice TV with a comb filter built in. If you're in a city, like I'm in Manhattan, and if I plug in RF into my TV here, it's so fuzzy you almost can't see it because there's quite literally millions of wireless networks interfering with it. <laughs> um, so generally, you know, if you can, try to use composite. Mm -hmm. Composite to S-Video, I think, is the biggest jump in quality. Um, which is kind of interesting because a lot of the games in the 16-bit era relied on the uh, messiness of composite video mm. to create some of their graphics. The blurriness so, that would that would kind of blend together and exactly. So it makes solid objects transparent. You know, dots in the background actually blend together to look like clouds, stuff like that. So it's a trade-off, right? You get so much sharper uh, of an image and clearer colors, but you don't get those weird and fun effects in it. And then RGB is definitely better than S video, but it's one of those things where depending on your display, you might not even notice. Um, so it, it's just a matter of how far you go. You know, if you're scaling to a 65 inch TV and you're, you know, you're using the best upscalers, you definitely would notice a difference, but not so much on CRTs. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, kind of stepping your way up through each of them. And let's and move over funny, to you mentioned the okay. JVC TV. Does mm -hmm. it happen to have uh, D series written on the top left of the bezel? I don't believe so. No, it's oh, just okay. like a more consumer -y kind of thing. And it, you know, it's interesting. It, it had like a real red tint to it uh, when I had, even when I was, I couldn't adjust the red out when I, even when I was mm -hmm. on composite, you know, Common and then, those. yeah. And, and I wanted to pivot to FPGA and, I'll, and, and in, to pivot there, I think I'll talk about my mister when I hooked up the mister for the first time. Uh, using an analog component cable that came out of the back of my mister, um, it suddenly looked beautiful. Like it just, I couldn't believe how good the NES games looked. My light gun worked like it did back in the, yeah. like all these things just started working better. I actually was able to hook up my, um, my analog console. I have the NT uh, mini, not the noir, <laughs> but the NT mini. And I was able to use that same cable on, on that. And it was amazing how good it looked. Like it just, everything, even though it was on a CRT, it just, it didn't look super sharp. It looked like a CRT, but it looked so much better. So I think there's some real benefit to having an RGB input on a TV. Um, mm. There's probably some ways you could mod a TV to have it take a, an RGB component input. Not easy. Absolutely. But... It's incredibly dangerous because you have to mm -hmm. discharge the tube. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always use the example like, I, I'm very comfortable telling people how to mod a Super Nintendo because the only way you're hurting yourself is if you do something stupid like try to mod it in the bathtub. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> It is not like that with CRTs. If you don't discharge the tube properly, uh, you will get zapped. Uh, and you know, how, how would you know if you don't have an existing heart issue? You know, the chances of death are not zero. Right. Whereas with a lot of the other stuff I talk about, you know, unless you do something very stupid, the chances of death are zero. So, right. Right. Because um, there's no there's yeah. no stored electricity in that NES game console when you when you. Take right. it apart when it's unplugged. <laughs> um, right. So I have restored. Input. I actually restored mm -hmm. a JVC uh, consumer grade TV mm -hmm. uh, with the component video inputs and back and everything because those a lot of those models were the same tubes used in some really high end arcade machines. Oh really? So they do look pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, that was the one thing I was always nervous to do, and I'm still. I think the first time I got comfortable doing it, I discharged it. You know, you have basically a screwdriver that's grounded to uh, the ground plug in your wall. Mm -hmm. And I discharged it and I go to grab the anode cap to pull it off. And my friend Jose is there, who's much more of an expert. And he's like, wait, 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 wait watch. And he hit it again. And there was still a little bit of a spark oh, left in it. And not wow. enough to seriously hurt me, but it would have scared right. the crap. <laughs> right. So it's a lot. It's, it's not for the not for the faint of heart, first of all. And certainly for I think if you haven't worked on electronics before, you might want to maybe find one with with that component input first. Before. Yeah. So you don't uh, even have to worry about it. But yeah. Uh, but yeah. I mean, you're right. Hooking those up to those old ones. Uh, the Mister is an excellent, excellent example because you could have outputs that none of the original consoles even came with, but it outputs in that high signal quality. And it's an open source project that's 
constantly being added to with some really amazing things going through it. So it's and definitely we, a good experience. And we did a whole hour and a half presentation on, on the value of FPGA, but I guess in a nutshell, it, it, it kind of it kind of nails every issue that you might run into, right? It, 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 it's, it's not very laggy, uh, even on HDMI, is that correct? No, it's a uh, zero lag on the analog outputs. And depending on how you have the settings at the moment, I think the most lag I've ever tested out of it was, uh, I think it was six milliseconds out of the HDMI. So for your average gamer, you could just think of that in your mind as zero, as a zero right. lag experience. Cause there's, you know, there's no way to tell. And I think there was even, there's been even more refinements in that. So if you're playing it on a CRT, like you are, it's, and the answer is it is measurable zero. There is no difference whatsoever, which is why things like light guns can work through certain adapters. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, you know, on the HDMI out, it's still low enough that you would absolutely never tell the difference from original hardware. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest things about having software emulation like or hardware emulation like FPGAs versus software emulation, um, you know both of those things the experience is going to depend on how well they're programmed and right. uh, and how accurate they are mm -hmm. but with software emulation you're always running a program written in a language that's run through an operating system that's being buffered on a video card whereas fpga it is just direct out as if imagine like terminator 2 and you know imagine these chips turning into the original consoles it's right. a really cheesy analogy but it's you know it's the basics of it so even if you have a slightly buggy fpga core it might be a better experience overall because you don't have to worry about lag or crashes or any of that other stuff so that's kind of why it's so important that we're moving along to that technology just because while there's still going to be tweaking and making things better um, it could be the most accurate recreation and I guess for me, what, what made sense with it, and I, first of all, I just love things that I can tinker on, and, and the, the Mister is such a fun project because it's constantly changing. There's always new things to download. The community has been very good at making it easy to get those things updated so that those update mm -hmm. scripts, I, you know, I, I, my Mister is sitting over there. I haven't booted it up in about two or three weeks. I can guarantee you it's going to be a, a, a you know, whole bunch of new stuff is going to be uh, delivered down to it for me. And what's been fun about it is that it can, it, it's, when you look at like a, a Raspberry Pi solution, which is another great fun way to start, I would say. Um, not perfect, right? But it's, it's a fun mm -hmm. way to start. Um, what I love about the Mister is that, you know, for all the things that I replicate with it, um, it replicates the computing experience. I can hook it up to a monitor upstairs and sit at a desk with a keyboard and pretend that I'm back in my uh, 80s uh, bedroom with my Apple IIe or whatever. I can then take it away from there and plug it into my television, and now it's a game console. And, you know, the experience is very close to, to zero lag. It's as, probably as good as it would be if I had a good scaler and the original console. And Absolutely. then I can take it over to my CRT television and, and have that same experience there with my old NES games. They actually look better and they play the same. Um, mm -hmm. So there's all these different things that you can do with it that really make it, um, I think, a lot of fun. And, and probably the, the, the best way to go if you don't mind not using the original, because it's so close to the original, it, it's, it's hard to discern the two, I would guess. Is that yeah, I, I couldn't agree more about that. And it's an open source project. There's a lot of great people in the community contributing to it. It's constantly evolving. And because it's written in FPGA language, it's not limited to this project. So let's just say 10 years from now, another, you know, another hardware board comes out and people want to port everything over. For, while I'm not an expert in this, from what I understand, it's not like saying, okay, I'm going to port something from Mac to Windows. It's more like, you know, hey, it used to work on Windows XP and it doesn't work on this one. Let's make the small changes available. You know, I'm sorry for oversimplifying. If there's any of the That's Mr. Okay. Team listening, they're going to be face palming. Like, oh, <laughs> I know, right? I'm, I'm just well, trying to keep it, keep it general. Th those people on the Mr. Team are, are so smart that I, I, I can't even imagine, I don't even know how they're doing this. So I think um, yeah. they probably do that with, with us, uh, us uh, YouTubers is quite often because <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, yeah. it's something that's beyond what I can understand. But I think for them, it's a real challenge, right? I mean, they're, they're taking actual chips and visually looking at the connections inside of these microscopic images to replicate the flow here. I mean, for people to understand, like this is taking the, the physical logic and and eyeballing it and making a neo geo come out the other end i, I can't even imagine yeah. how 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 much talent that takes to do and this is for many of them just a hobby right it's not a, yeah. a career so it's yeah for many of the team members they most of them have some kind of technical background but it's often not 
not in FPGA engineering at all. So it's kind of cool to see. Well, my favorite feature at the moment, which is this is a very small one, but it just it, what it represents is why it's my favorite feature. But on the Sega Genesis core, you could turn on adaptive composite blending, which means for something like uh, first level of Sonic 1, you walk over to the first waterfall. And what we talked about before about how developers had used tricks with composite video to blend stuff together. Well, if you'd watched that in RGB, uh, you would just see a bunch of rectangles going down and, you know, it's water, but, you know, it's it's almost too sharp. But you turn on adaptive blending and the entire image stays sharp, except the water that blends as if it were on a composite video TV to give you the water effect. So this is the reason that's my favorite feature is because that essentially is one of the first times you could confidently say that this experience is better than the original um, you know, if you're looking for stuff like that. So it just goes to show what could possibly be in the future, you know? And what are you most excited about in the coming years here? Because there's been a lot that's happened over the last two or three years in this, I don't, don't want to call it a hobby. I almost want to call it a, a community. Um, hmm. There's some really good things. There's some really bad things. Um, there's some people, I think sometimes they bite off more than they can chew. And, and there's all these different dramas that happen throughout. But, but there's clearly some things that you must be excited about as someone who covers this space for getting old consoles working again. We've got a whole generation of consoles, I think, like the 3DO and the Sega Saturn and the Dreamcast that obviously are too complicated for FPGA. So, so these types of, of hardware and software solutions are still important. What are you excited about? Like what's left to do? It's a lot left to do. Um, and there's a ton that I'm excited about. And uh, I got to be careful because uh, I'm sworn you got to some things you, right. most of this stuff. You, you know uh, things, don't you? <laughs> I might. Um, I will say that uh, over the next year or two, there's absolutely going to be even more ways to make it even easier to get original consoles looking great on flat panel TVs. And there's going to be a lot of other uh, FPGA recreations of stuff. Um, some of it's uh, just being talked about at the moment. Some of it's already in the works. Um, and there's just, if you follow the scene, it's, I guess a better way is a lot of the same, but better. Mm -hmm. And and there's going to be some curveballs coming up, although I'm not sure how quickly any of the, the crazy, crazy stuff will be released. But it's definitely probably the best time ever to be a retro gamer. That's for sure. It sure is. And, and it's funny, I, 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 you know, I, I was thinking back with the cyberpunk game that just came out, you know, I was playing around with them like, yeah, this looks cool, you know, and, and it, it wasn't <laughs> grabbing me. But, you know, I've been I've been playing through because I never had an opportunity to play it when it was originally available because I didn't have the hardware at the time. Um, the uh, the Castlevania game on the TurboGrafx 16 CD or the PC Engine CD, um, you mm -hmm. know, which one I'm talking about. Um, yep. It's amazing. It's like the music is awesome. The, the graphics are amazing, like just all of that stuff. And, it's, and you can really appreciate playing these older games that really kind of defined what we play today. You know, it's almost like every genre of game is connected to these, these retro games in some way that um, you, you develop a real kind of appreciation for just where these games came from. And I think you almost look at these older games under a, under a completely new lens, right? Like Super Mario Brothers 3 is just a masterpiece, right? It was a fun yeah. game at the time, but it's just, it's just amazing to see all that. So let's do a quick uh, little lightning round here. Um, because again, we've got consoles that can't be fpga atized at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So what do I do if I got a Nintendo 64? I'm, I'm, a millen I'm not a millennial, but I'm a millennial. Um, and uh, I'm an Atari guy, okay? Uh, I'm a millennial. I got my Nintendo 64 out of the closet. Um, it, it boots up. It works. What should I do? I want this game. I want to be able to play Mario 64 and not have too much lag. What should I get? Uh, either the RetroTINK uh, Mini or mm -hmm. the Rad 2X. Um, both of them will perform pretty much exactly the same. They're actually both designed by Mike Chi. Uh, if you already have the original cables, um, or, or if you, uh, especially if you're in North America, I think the Mini even comes with an S video cable. So uh, the only the only decision that you would have to make is: Do you want something that just plugs in and works, or do you want something that plugs in and works? but you could upgrade later on if you wanted to. So, uh, but I think most people would probably just grab the RetroTINK Mini um, and then that's it. That's there, it. There is not anything else. Simple. And in fact, uh, the Mini has, all of the RetroTINKs have this filter on it mm -hmm. that uh, if you're playing 2D games, in my opinion, it looks absolutely awful. However, <laughs> with low-res 3D games like N64, PlayStation 1, I really think it blends it in a way where when combined with 
the scaling of your flat panel TV, it looks really good, like surprisingly good. And would those solutions work on like the Saturn and the, the PlayStation also? I, you would probably recommend the same things there? So the, that is the other thing is the Rad 2X, there's one per console. Okay, so if you it. only have one console to connect, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good choice. But if you say, all right, I'm going to have my N64, but I also have a Saturn and a PS1, I would definitely say get the RetroTank Mini because then you just buy a couple of cables and then just use the same scaler for each device. So multiple consoles, RetroTank Mini, and then I'm, I'm guessing you probably would suggest getting a S-Video cable for all of those consoles to connect to it. Depending what your favorite games are. So like mm -hmm. on PlayStation 1, if your favorite game is Symphony of the Night, then yeah, get an S-Video cable, have those nice sharp pixels. But if your favorite game is like Silent Hill, you almost want that composite messiness. Otherwise, you're just looking at a whole bunch of dots every time there's fog or snow. Mm. Interesting. So it's a, a cable choice can make a difference here as far as what that, that experience is like. All right, so yeah. let's move up to like PlayStation 2 and the Dreamcast. What, what should we get there? Um, at the moment, probably uh, component video cables for the PlayStation 2, um, an RGB SCART or VGA cable for the Dreamcast. The RGB ones are probably best. And then go through an open source scan converter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that both would either digitize it or uh, line double it to make it even sharper if your TV is compatible. And that's that's kind of an interesting thing too as well because it's doubling 480 to 960, so you end up getting a pretty sharp thing. But mm, so yeah, those are better. two interesting consoles. The only other one that... Um, and by the way, let's back up. The open source scan converter, how, can I just buy one of those things or I got to build build it? Nope, you just buy it. Uh, Video oh, Game Perfection has the original ones. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are some companies that sell good versions, but there's also a bunch of clone companies out there that have just made cheap garbage versions that you know, I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't waste my money on. So I would always buy the original and they're all similarly priced too. So I don't, you know, there's no point in buying one from a scalper unless for whatever reason, shipping is completely insane, uh, depending on from where it ships to where you live. Got it. And then when we get into like the Xbox and the GameCube, what do we do with those? At that point, um, as long as you're running it in 480p, uh, mm -hmm. all you would need is some kind of, well, for the Xbox, all you would need is some way to get that to HDMI just to ensure that you don't have to deal with TV's bad analog inputs like we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are certain devices out there that are plug and play. There's an ad adapter from Chimeric Systems that's, that's really good. Um, you could try to get original component video cables and just go through a generic converter. Just remember, cheap, junky cables are going to have a cheap, junky output to them. So, you know, that's kind of the trick. Um, GameCube, that's much easier. Just buy something called a Carby. Uh, Insurrection Industries makes it their... $70, I think, give or take. It might have gone up because everything's going up lately. Right. Where you plug right in the back of your GameCube. You get HDMI directly out of it. Uh, it is a true digital to digital solution. It just it works perfectly. Um, and it's as if it, it's equal to if the GameCube came with an HDMI port in it. Hmm. And so that's it. And you're good to go. Or if you have the CRT in the basement next to the console, that's probably the best way to, to, to go if you if you just want to get going, right? For almost all of these solutions, I would say yes for the CRT. The only the only ones that wouldn't be are any PlayStation 2 game that runs in 480p would look great on either a VGA monitor or a flat panel. Uh, all Dreamcast games can, well, all but like three, could run in 480p. Uh, and those look amazing um, you know, on newer screens as well. And uh, same thing with the original Xbox. Pretty much all of them can be either run in 480p or be forced to 480p. So all of those you could do on a flat panel and they'll look really amazing. Um, anything before those though, yeah, if you have a CRT, it's it's gonna be almost a better picture in many cases, especially for PlayStation 2, because most of the library is 480i, right. which is interlaced, so same as TV signals were back in the day, which on a CRT looks fine, but on a flat panel it could look weird, it could look flickery, There's there's a lot of different there's a lot of things that I don't think they anticipated how bad it would look once the next generation of TVs came out. Got it. And then uh, one last question uh, before we have to run, we're running a little short on time here. Um, we could go on for like four hours on all this stuff. <laughs> um, I, got a, I got an old console, like a Dreamcast, a Saturn or a PlayStation. My optical drive is dead. My TurboGrafx optical drive is going or my PC engine. Uh, there's some solutions out there now to, to fix that too, right? 
Yeah, so um, a lot of these consoles have ODEs, optical drive emulators, mm -hmm. uh, some of which you could just plug right in. Others, most of them require some kind of modification. Uh, but essentially, you're replacing the CD-ROM drive with an SD card reader. Um, there's a bunch of different brands out there. Um, all of the most recent ones from the past two years are excellent. Um, the the GameCube one, I think, is is the most popular because if you just have a screwdriver, that's all you need. There's no oh, soldering. Really? It's it's tedious because there's like a million screws inside a GameCube. <laughs> right. But yeah, what, what, what's you, that? What's that product called? The GameCube one. GC Loader. GC Loader. Got it. Okay. I heard. I think I heard you say it, but I missed it. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's basically it. You just unbolt your whole GameCube. You mm -hmm. put this thing in its place. You bolt it back together. Uh, Greg from Laser Bear Industries has these three D printed um adapter kits that they make for it so if you put his kit in as well when you open up the lid of the gamecube the cd tray is filled in so you can't drop anything in there and the sd card access is right there oh cool so even it, it almost you know if you ever go to change the sd out or swap games you still have that fun experience of opening the, <laughs> opening lid the door right there, just flash media rather than discs Right. And I got I bought the mode for my Saturn and my Dreamcast. And that was, at least for me, it was surprisingly easy to install it. I didn't have to do anything all that crazy. Um, so they make some good stuff, too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the Dreamcast one's easier because that's also just plug and play. And Greg mm -hmm. also makes those laser bear adapters for that as well. Uh, Saturn, depending on your revision, you might have to solder something or, you know, just jam a power wire in or something like right. that. So it's, you know, it's not as easy, but yeah, they both they both work really well. Um, the Saturn ones, though, um, there's other options for the Saturn that are far cheaper, which the mode's a great piece of hardware, but mm -hmm. it's, it's all just uh, pick pick and choose the total solution that you want. You know, it's it's there's there isn't always a right answer. If there's options, it's just the right answer for your full setup. And there is one right answer, which is going to retroRGB.com because <laughs> if you if you don't know what you're looking for or you want to get started, I'm sure it's easy to kind of go through the tags on the site and try to figure out. You, know, you can really get a lot of good good content and reviews and Bob reviews everything that comes out in this space. That's good. Um, and some things that aren't so good and he'll tell you as much. And that's what I've always appreciated about Bob's content is that, you know, he, he tells it like it is. And it's uh, it, even the good companies, you know, sometimes they don't do so good on certain things and he'll, he'll point it out and it, and it makes them better. So it's, uh, it's a great resource. I go there all the time. Uh, our mutual friend Smoke Monsters on there posting things as well. We got to get him on for an interview too. Um, yeah. So it's it's all uh, really, really good stuff. And we've been chatting here for almost an hour, about 45 minutes just about this stuff. And you can just get an idea as to how much more you can do. Uh, so definitely check out Bob's site. Check out our, our review that we did uh, of the whole FPGA landscape as of about a year and a half ago. It's a little bit different now. We may have to update that at some point. But uh, beyond that, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. This was a lot of fun. So I want to thank Bob for coming on the channel this week to talk about what he does and let me know what you thought of the interview because I'd like to do more of these, bringing on some of the creators that I like to listen to and watch and hear about how they do what they do. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. I want to first thank some super chatters who contributed this week, including Grayson Petty, Brian Parker, Saturn Otaku, Tim IT Tech, and Mark Dell. They all made their contributions during one of my live streams this week. Uh, we also have a new supporter on the channel who joined via the YouTube membership program. His name is John Clark. I want to thank John and everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis too, and everyone who watches on a regular basis because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. And I do ask that you head over to some of my other channels, including my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. I'm trying to boost up my follower base there, so definitely give me a follow over there if you don't mind. And then, of course, we have an audio version of this show now at lon.tv slash podcast. And you'll be able to listen to this uh, show uh, there every week. We usually post it on Wednesday or so. You can engage with the channel at a couple of different places, including my email list and our Facebook group. And then, of course, we've got the store where I sell previously used items that I reviewed here on the channel. And we've got an iPad Air up there right now. And if you want to get notified every time we add something to the store, you can head over to lon.tv slash store alert and get an email delivered to you to let you know uh, when new stuff gets listed. And that is going to do it for now. Thank you all for your continued viewership and support. Merry Christmas to all of you. This will be the last wrap-up before Christmas time, but I think we've got one more before the new year. 
Uh, so next week, I think I'll talk about some of my predictions for 2021, and we'll see how many of those are wrong in 2022. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, Frank Lewandowski, Mark Bollinger, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.